I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Elaine Mills is a member of the 2012 Master Garden Training Class, whose primary interest is in the sustainable gardening. She created the first set of fact sheets on the tried and true native plants that are now a popular resource on our website. She spent eight years photographing native plants in public and private gardens and enjoys selecting pictures from her photo library to illustrate her talks, articles, and weekly educational posts to our Facebook group, Instagram, and Twitter. In addition, she serves as one, as the, one of the coordinators for the Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden in Arlington. And I think just looking at Elaine's first slide right there, you'll get a, a, a really good impression of her beautiful photos. So thank you, Elaine, and we're ready to turn it over to you. Excellent, thank you so much, Leslie. Welcome everyone to today's presentation, Selecting Native Plants for Your Home Garden. This is one of our classes in the Sustainable Landscaping series. To give you an overview of today's presentation, first I'll give you uh, a definition of what I mean by native plants and talk about some of the advantages of using them. Uh, I'll discuss appropriate plants for our particular region. I'll also be presenting the plants um, in some landscape scenarios. We'll be looking at about 86 different species. And those landscape scenarios will include forest communities, some lawn or specimen trees, shrubs that you might choose for hedgerows or foundations, ground covers, and perennials for a variety of different settings. And interspersed with the discussion of those different scenarios, I'll be presenting some best management tips. So what are native plants? These are species that occur naturally in a particular region, ecosystem, or habitat. And they've evolved over time by interacting with the local soils, the climate, fauna, and other plants and there is no human intervention involved in this. For North America, this means that uh, native plants are those that are considered to be present prior to European settlement. There are some advantages of using native plants. First of all, they're uh, very resilient against environmental stresses. They're adapted to our particular low, uh, local growing conditions and they're going likely to do well once established. They won't require heavy inputs of fertilizers or pesticides. They'll provide a distinctive sense of place because they reflect uh, the plant communities of our region, our particular forests, our wetlands, our meadows. And very importantly, they provide ecosystem services. That means they build our air quality, they improve water quality, and they clean our air. Another crucial advantage of using native plants is their relationship with the local fauna that they have evolved with. For example, they can provide nectar and pollen for our adult pollinators. They can serve as larval hosts for the caterpillars of Lepidoptera. That means the butterflies, moths, and skippers. They can offer food and cover and nesting materials uh, to wildlife. They possess uh, desirable ornamental qualities, beautiful uh, flowers in many colors and shapes that bloom over uh, the entire growing season, lovely fruits that uh, provide nourishment to our wildlife, fall color that rivals any non-native plants, and they have interesting uh, seed heads and flower heads, uh, for example, on the grasses as shown here that uh, provide winter interest. And of course, there are numerous species to choose from. Now, um, Doug Tellamy, the uh, entomologist from the University of Delaware, uh, being aware that insects are really the fundamental part of nature's food webs, decided to conduct a study with his 
a graduate student, Desiree Narango, and they were joined by Peter Mera of the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. And they wanted to see what landscapes, and they were looking here, particularly in the DC area, what landscapes would support a maximum number of caterpillars. They were looking at caterpillars specifically, the caterpillars of our local butterflies and moths, because they know that those are the basic food that, um, that birds will use to feed their young. And they were looking specifically at uh, the Carolina chickadee. And in conducting that study, they discovered that landscapes, home landscapes that had a biomass of 70% native plants were able to allow those chickadees to raise their young. That means uh, biomass refers to the, to the size, the, the quantity of plants. And of course, our woody plants being larger are going to uh, represent more biomass in the garden. Now, 70% native plants still would allow uh, homeowners to use 30% of their favorite um, non-native uh, species, as long as they are, are not uh, invasive plants. So what are the appropriate native plants for our region? Now, I am going to be speaking because I'm here in Arlington, Virginia, for Virginia. And we're lucky uh, because we are at the southern end of the mid-Atlantic range of species. And we're also at the northern end of the uh, southeastern species. Now, for those of you who are attending from outside our region, many of the species that I'm going to be talking about are native to the mid-Atlantic and perhaps somewhat into the southeast and perhaps even um, across a, a good half of the uh, eastern United States. Here in Virginia, we have three ecoregions from east to west. They are the coastal plain, the Piedmont and the mountain region. And here locally, we're right along the fall line, which means that we can take advantage of some plants that are native to the coastal plain and some that are native to the Piedmont. And just looking here locally uh, in Alexandria, that's in the coastal plain and they tend to have uh, soils that are sandy or, or a mix of types and the Piedmont tends to have clay soil. The original natural landscape for this region was what's referred to as the Eastern Deciduous Forest. And this was a mix of broadleaf trees, such as oaks, maples, birches, mixed in with some conifers. And in our region, uh, referred to as the temperate region, we have four distinct se seasons. There is a high level of biodiversity and the forest layers are, are four, the canopy, the understory, the shrub layer and the forest floor. Now, before we actually start looking at very specific plants, I wanted to uh, make you aware of some handouts that I have provided. The links to those were provided in the same email that was sent out giving you the link uh, to this Zoom session. And the links will also be uh, posted on our website when the recording of, of this session is posted. Uh, the first of these um, is a four page handout called Selecting Native Plants. This is a list of all the plants I'm going to be discussing and you can follow along. The ones that are underlined, that represents active links that you can use to go directly to fact sheets uh, for the plants on our website. I'm doing this so you have both the common and scientific names of the plants and um, you can take a few notes here, but my intention is really that you won't have to be madly writing things down. You can sit back and relax knowing that you can go to detailed fact sheets about the plants um, at a later time. And in addition, you'll be able to, to check the recording and go to certain sections of that and go back and listen to anything you might have missed. The second handout, um, uh, in sets, includes a set of screenshots for some sections of this presentation. These are screenshots having to do with the different tips I'll be providing on best management practices. So again, sit back, relax, you know you have these resources and you can, you can uh, refer to them in the future. So we have a lot to discuss. Uh, let's get started looking at the first landscape scenarios for forest communities.
This would be if you wanted to try to recreate some of the natural uh, plant communities that exist in Northern Virginia. There are four basic types and we'll be looking at two of those. The first is the basic mesic forest. This occurs in low elevation habitats in both the coastal plain and the outer region of the Piedmont. This uh, type of forest tends to occur where there are fertile soils and moderate amounts of moisture. That's what mesic refers to. This particular photograph was taken at Turkey Run Park. The canopy trees in this type of forest uh, are American beech and tulip poplar. American beech, Fagus grandifolia, is a very tall tree, deciduous, and it has attractive silvery gray bark. The leaves uh, are very distinctive with these uh, parallel veins, and they turn this attractive tan, uh, you can see in the, the, uh, the larger photo, and those leaves will actually be retained on the trees um, into the spring. The other uh, canopy tree in this region is the tulip poplar, Liriodendron tulipifera. These are, again, very tall trees. They have a columnar habit, habit with uh, just simply retaining the, the upper branches with a very tall trunk. These uh, trees have flowers with copious nectar and golden fall foliage. Both of these trees uh, provide many wildlife services uh, offering nesting habitat, and they also serve as larval hosts for those caterpillars and moths. An understory tree in this forest is the pawpaw, Essamina triloba, a 15 to 30 foot tree with a short trunk and a rounded crown. This tree has very attractive uh, brownish purple flowers in the April, and when pollinated, these will form late summer fruits that are uh, very popular with wildlife. Uh, a shrub in this forest is spice bush, Lindera benzawin. It has a very open habit, and this is what we refer to as a dioecious plant. That means that there are separate plants for the male and female flowers. These early spring flowers are actually showing on spice bush uh, in my garden right now. And in the fall, these will offer nutritious fruits referred to as droops. These are very high in lipids, which means that they're going to provide great nourishment for migrating birds. In the herb layer of the forest, we'll see false Solomon seal, Myanthema racemosum. This is a plant that has arching stems about two to three feet high, and it will spread via rhizomes to form colonies. It has these very attractive flower plumes that appear in April, and then later the fall fruit will appear. It's a kind of a brownish color here, but it will turn red. And a taller plant in the herb layer is common black cohosh, Actea racemosa, much taller at four to six feet. It has these spires of fragrant flowers from June to July. Also in the herb layer, Jack in the Pulpit, Erisema trifilum. This is a very distinctive showy wildflower that blooms in April. And when the flower head fades, these compound leaves will actually grow above it at a one to two feet. And then later in the summer, a late fruit will develop. Also in the herb layer, two additional plants. The first is May apple, Podophyllum peltatum. It uh, reaches one to two feet with these palmately lobed leaves that you see here with a kind of an umbrella form. And under those umbrellas in uh, the axles of double-leaved plants, you'll see these white nodding flowers. And when pollinated, those will form this lemon-shaped, very fleshy fruit that is particularly appealing to our local box turtles. And the other plant pictured with the fern-like foliage is Dutchman's breeches, Dicentra cucularia. It has very waxy flowers and they resemble uh, pantaloons. Now, both of these flowers, uh, both of these plants will send up their foliage and they will flower and then they will, uh, they will go dormant for the summer. They're referred to as ephemeral plants. 
Also in the herb layer and uh, lasting throughout the growing season are wild ginger and foam flower. Wild ginger, Acerum canadense, reaches about six to 12 inches in height. It has velvety heart-shaped leaves and it will spread slowly by rhizomes. Tucked underneath the foliage, hidden beneath, are these charming tricorn flowers uh, that will bloom from April to May. And these are pollinated by flies and beetles. Foam flower, Tiarella cordifolia, reaches about six to 12 inches in height. It has lobed evergreen leaves. And as you'll see here, the, the veins of those leaves are uh, tinged a slightly darker color has beautiful spires of airy spring flowers. And this plant will spread via stolons, which are above ground stems. So both of these plants will form a very attractive ground cover in the herb layer of the forest. Uh, there are two ferns that are native to the herb layer. The first is Christmas fern, Polystichum acrosticoides. This reaches anywhere from six inches to two feet and its habit is a circular cascading clump. When you mass it as shown here, it is quite effective at pro uh, providing erosion control. This plant has evergreen fronds leading to the name Christmas fern. And the second reason for that name is that the pinne, the little leaflets are said to resemble Christmas stockings. The second fern in this forest is maidenhair fern. Adiantum pedatum. It reaches one to two feet and has striking black stalks. Now, the very unusual thing about this fern is that the fronds are held horizontally in kind of a fan like arrangement. And the pinne, the, the leaflets, are very delicate. Looking at a second forest for our region, the acidic oak hickory forest. This is found throughout the Piedmont in less fertile and somewhat drier soil. And this particular photo was taken in the forest at Great Falls in Virginia. Uh, two canopy trees for this forest are white and red oak. White oak is really a majestic tree reaching as much as 75 feet in height and quite broad with a rounded shape. It's a slow growing tree. And you'll recognize these spring catkins, the rounded lobed leaves and acorns. This is what Doug Tallamy refers to as a keystone species. That means that it is a type of plant that provides great nourishment to the Lepidoptera, those uh, caterpillar stage uh, feeding stage of the butterflies, moths, and skippers. This particular tree uh, sponsors, it, it provides support for over 500 different species. Absolutely amazing. The red oak, Quercus rubra, is somewhat shorter at around 50 to feet at mature height. It has a more irregular crown and a brownish red fall color. In the understory, you'll see uh, our Virginia state tree, the flowering dogwood, Cornus florida. It reaches about 15 to 30 feet with horizontal branching. And you'll recognize, of course, these white or pink petal-like bracts. The flowers themselves are the yellow part in, in the center of the, the, the bracts. And it has brilliant fall leaves and the fruit that's so attractive to our wildlife. Another understory tree, you may not have realized this is a native tree, is Eastern Redbud, Circus canadensis. It reaches about 15 to 30 feet. It has a short trunk and spreading branches. It will be covered with copious flower clusters, some of which actually emerge directly from the trunk and the branches in uh, clusters in April. And they uh, provide wonderful uh, early nectar source for our native bees. They have interesting heart-shaped uh, leaves and these pea-like seed pods will develop later in the season and they can provide nourishment for birds. In their understory, you'll find two shrubs. The first is witch hazel, Habamelis virginiana. 
it reaches about 15 to 20 feet and is usually multi-stemmed and it can spread if you desire to form an actual colony. Witch hazel is uh, interesting in that it is a fall blooming plant. Uh, it blooms in November into early December and is pollinated by a type of moth that can actually survive into the chillier temperatures. And a lovely shrub in this understory is Pinkster bloom azalea, rhododendron periclimenoides. It reaches about three to six feet in height. And unlike the Asian azaleas that many are familiar with, this plant is deciduous. It has horizontal branching and like the witch hazel, it can sucker. It has fragrant flowers, beautiful clusters of pink flowers. In the herb layer, you'll find beard tongue, Penstemon digitalis. It begins with a, a growth of basal leaves, a rosette, and then it will send up a tall flower stalk about three feet tall, which has showy tubular flowers in April, attractive to many different types of pollinators and also to hummingbirds. Uh, also in this herb layer, you'll see Solomon seal, Polygonatum biflorum. This has arching stems that reach anywhere from one to three feet in height and these charming paired, uh, paired dangling flowers. And when those are pollinated, they will form this fall fruit. Lower down in the herb layer, you'll find partridge berry, Michella repens. This reaches only four inches in height. It has shiny pairs of evergreen leaves and also paired flowers. And when those are pollinated, the joint flowers will form these uh, bright red fall fruits. Pennsylvania sedge, Carex pennsylvanica, reaches about six inches in height. It's semi evergreen and has a fountaining habit with these very delicate leaf like fronds. It can spread to form loose colonies and can be particularly effective when used as a ground cover in a dry shade areas. It could actually replace a grass that won't, won't grow well in those conditions. It can't take the foot traffic that the grass can take, but if you were to uh, uh, set some foot, uh, some little stepping stones going through between the, the plants, you'd be able to use it as a very effective ground cover in a forest. So some tips, these would pertain uh, really to any uh, type of garden, but uh, certainly to, to the forest. Anytime before you start planting, you're going to want to test your soil and you can get soil test kits from Virginia Cooperative Extension. I believe Leslie is going to provide you a link for how to, uh, how to find those soil test kits, how to, how to find them locally. What you would do would be to mail them in locally to Virginia Tech and you would receive a report like that pictured below. The reason why you want to get this test is because the pH of your soil will determine the availability of nutrients for your plants. So the pH uh, is measured in numbers uh, and 7.0 is considered to be neutral. Any numbers below that represent acidic soil and above that basic soil. Now, most plants grow in the range 6.0 to 7.0. The so-called ericaceous plants, those that like acid soil, such as rhododendrons, azaleas, and blueberries, um, they prefer soil ranges in the acidic range 4.5 to 6.0. And some ferns actually prefer alkaline or basic soil at 7.0 to 8.0. Now on this soil test, uh, my soil test result was 7.0, so right in that neutral range. You might also want to test for organic matter, the richness of that matter in your soil. Five points, uh, excuse me, six, four to six percent is considered ideal. And I felt I did very well with organic matter at 7.9%. Another tip for creating that, that forested environment is to plant in layers. And to replicate a forest community, you would start by making use of any existing canopy level trees that you might have. 
then you could choose new trees that would be appropriate for your particular soil and the mature size that you would like. So for example, I have tulip poplars in my garden. Next, you would select any understory trees and shrubs for your remaining woody structure. So here's some examples from my yard. And then you would fill in with a variety of the ground layer plants, herbaceous plants of various heights, ferns such as those I showed you, and cool season grasses and sedges. Back up so you can take a look at those. Another tip for your forested area is to leave the leaf litter that, that comes from those deciduous trees. You want to let that decompose because that's what's going to help build up that organic content of your soil. Uh, another reason would be that many of our native insects are going to actually overwinter in, in the leaf litter. And the leaf litter will provide protection for the emerging herb layer of plants in the spring. Do we have any questions at this point, Aista? Yes, Elaine, um, we have a few questions. Uh, one of the questions we have is, are any of the herb layer plants that you discussed tolerant of black walnuts? We do have some, some conversation in the chat um, sharing the links of friends and foes of black walnut, but maybe you can comment on that as well. Um, one important reason that I've listed uh, the provided links to the fact sheets is that is the very specific kind of information that we provide. We will tell people whether plants uh, are somewhat deer resistant, whether they can handle conditions uh, such as growing at the foot of, of black walnut, uh, whether there are any particular diseases or, or pests that would affect them. So I figured there's such a, a, a wide range of plants, uh, a great number of them that I want to introduce just briefly today. I'm not going into lots and lots of detail, but the fact sheets will answer all of those questions and provide additional tips on uh, growing and maintaining the plants. Thank you so much. Um, one other question is, is it, um, is it okay to put hardwood mulch over the leaf litter and when would be a good time to do that? Uh, what you want to do is, I, I would wait to put the mulch down until, until springtime, when the temperatures are, are warming up into the, into the, at least the 50s, maybe even the low 60s. That is going to allow those native insects that have been overwintering in your leaf litter to emerge. And then if you desired to put down an, an additional layer of mulch, you, you could do that. Um, if you want to, what I do in, in my forested area is just simply to retain the leaves themselves and let that act as a natural mulch. So Eileen, um, related to this question, do we need to dig up, dig up the grass or weeds or ground cover around the canopy of trees before planting native? Do, do you need to weed? Uh, to weed or dig up the grass or, or existing ground cover. Oh, you mean if you wanted to start a whole forest garden? Um, ye yes, you would want, to, you could either, uh, gent you, if you're digging around trees, you're want, going to want to do it gently so that you're not disturbing those roots, but you could take up um, any turf grass that you had there. There are also techniques where you can actually smother, smother that grass. Um, I, I found, I, I started in my garden by actually introducing a couple of trees. And as they cast shade, the, uh, the grass, the turf grass that had been there began to peter out. It wasn't doing particularly well. So it was fairly easy to, to take that up. Uh, one of the other uh, classes that has been given on Land, uh, sustainable landscaping. I, I will make mention of it shortly and, I, and you will see a link to it in the handout, discusses a lot of ways that you can begin establishing a garden. Uh, so I'll, I'll let people refer to that for more details. 
Great, thank you. Um, are there other plants besides wild ginger that are pollinated by flies? Um, many, many of our plants are pollinated by flies. Uh, for those who are interested, I did a whole talk on gardening for pollinators. Uh, locally, or, or just in, in general, it's our native bees, not the honeybees that we think of as pollinating many of our agricultural crops, but the native bees that are the primary pollinators for our plants. They pollinate a, a wide variety of plants. Uh, the perennials, shrubs, trees. Um, flies are also very successful pollinators, but not quite as, um, as efficient as the bees. The bees have fuzzy, downy bodies, and that uh, allows them to, to collect the pollen on, the body, on their bodies. And then as they move from plant to plant, that will, that will spread the pollen. But flies, uh, uh, especially surfid flies, S Y R. PHID uh, are attracted to many of our flowering plants. Uh, Lepidoptera, that means the, the butterflies, moths, and skippers are also pollinators. Because their bodies are not hairy, they don't tend to be quite as efficient as the, as the bees. And of course, hummingbirds can even spread a certain amount of pollen. Thank you, Elaine. Are there any native edible plants that you would recommend for either of the forest community types? Well, of course, pawpaws um, are, are edible not only by wildlife, but uh, by humans. So that would be a, a great example. Uh, some of the shrubs that I'll be talking about uh, have fruit that can be enjoyed both by wildlife and can be used uh, either eaten raw or in, in culinary preparations. And I'll try to make a point of, of uh, mentioning that as we go along. Let's move on. Now, let's say you don't feel that you have enough room in your yard to create an entire layered forest, but you might want to consider some native lawn or specimen trees. So we'll look at those here. Uh, beginning with uh, some trees for dry conditions. The first is Eastern Red Cedar, Juniperus virginiana. It reaches about 30 to 60 feet mature height. It has a columnar shape and is evergreen. And it's notable because of its silvery gray to red brown bark. It has very dense dark scale like foliage, a perfect hiding place cover for our wildlife. And on the female trees, you will see these blue berry-like cones. Another tree, this would be an understory level tree at 15 to 25 feet is downy service berry, Amelanchier arborea. It usually uh, comes in a multi-stemmed form. It has these beautiful white flowers that are an early source of nectar for our pollinators. And when those are are pollinated, they will form this delicious berry-like fruit. And this is a perfect example of a fruit that can be used uh, to make, uh, eat, I believe eaten uh, raw and used to make uh, fruits, uh, preserves and, and jams and used in cooking such as pies. Now this particular tree, you're not going to want to plant next to the, the previous tree, the Eastern Red Cedar. They are both uh, hosts of a, a rust disease, and you wouldn't want that disease to spread from one plant to another. Another great native tree for dry conditions is fringe tree, Cyanthus virginicus. It reaches 20 to 35 feet and is quite often found in a multi-stemmed form. This is another one of the dioecious plants, plants with separate male and female flowers. And speaking of those flowers, they are lovely. They're very fragrant from May to June. And if you have a female tree with, uh, with um, a male pollinator tree nearby, you will get fruit. Uh, it uh, looks very much like olives. In fact, this tree is in the olive family. It begins green and then will turn darker shades of, of blue and purple as it matures. Here are some examples of trees for wet conditions. The first is bald cypress, Taxodium disticum. 
It's unusual because it is a deciduous conifer. It has lovely, very soft needle-like leaves. They're green as shown on the full tree. And then it will turn these beautiful shades of a gold and cinnamon in the fall. And, the, and the, those will drop. Now you may recognize this tree in wetland areas. It will form these so-called knees. And these structures allow the tree to obtain oxygen to get it to its roots if it's growing in very wet, boggy conditions. The, the knees won't tend to form so much uh, if you're growing this in a lawn. Another great tree for uh, wet conditions is river birch, Betula nigra. It reaches uh, 50 to 70 feet uh, mature height. This is a very fast growing deciduous tree. And it's most attractive in its multi-stemmed form. Uh, it usually will have three trunks. Its most notable characteristic is this exfoliating papery bark, which peels off in many lovely colors. Another nice tree for wet conditions is black gum, Nyssa sylvatica. I was lucky enough to have this tree. It was one of the native selections available through Eco Action Arlington as they're trying to help us uh, rebuild our tree canopy. This tree is deciduous. It, it's notable because of its straight trunk and it has uh, an early nectar source from its flowers and then a uh, bluish fruit for wildlife in the fall. Outstanding fall color. Two more specimen trees for wet conditions. Uh, American hornbeam, Carpinus caroliniana, is one that maybe not as quite, quite as familiar. I find it particularly attractive and uh, would recommend uh, its use in, in greater quantities. It reaches about 20 to 35 feet and has a very attractive rounded form. Uh, the branching is particularly uh, appealing to birds for nesting. This tree is attractive through the seasons because of its fluted bark. Uh, our Sweet Bay Magnolia is another good choice, Magnolia virginiana. This tree is much shorter than the uh, Southern Magnolia, which is, is quite tall and, and has the, the leathery evergreen leaves. This one is semi-evergreen. It has beautiful fragrant blooms. And uh, this is another example of a plant that is pollinated by beetles. It's uh, from a very ancient family and beetles were the very first of the po Earth's pollinators. In the fall, it will develop this cone-like fruit, very similar to that of the Southern Magnolia. Now, an important tip when you're planting trees is to allow plenty of room for tree roots to spread. People used to believe that the uh, amount of roots beneath the surface was comparable to the height of the tree above the soil. But in fact, most of the tree's roots will actually be in a soil depth of about one to three feet. But the important thing uh, to remember is that those roots will also grow laterally. Uh, they will grow at least to the drip line, what's referred to as the drip line. That's the edge, the outer edge of the, the branches, the canopy, but the root zone can actually go well beyond the width of the canopy. So you're not going to want to plant a tree near a, a driveway or sidewalks. You want them to really have a lot of, of room to spread. Uh, here are some tips for tree planting. Fall is usually the ideal time for planting. Again, you would want to look at the fact sheets that we're uh, linking to to, to see because some of the trees actually do better when planted in the spring. If you go to the Arbor Day website, you can see lots of details. Plants, uh, trees will come from a nursery in three different forms, uh, bare root uh, in a container and uh, uh, with canvas wrapped root balls. So you can get lots of details on, on how to do the actual planting. You're going to want to re uh, refill the, hoil, the hole the planting hole with the original soil. That will allow the roots to begin reaching out beyond the, uh, the hole into the uh, surrounding area. The trunk flare, the, the part that uh, reaches a little bit wider at the base should definitely be planted above the soil line. 
and you'll want to water deeply when planting and maintain that regularly until the tree is established for the first several years. You'll want to certainly remove any tags and keep an eye on any guide supports to make sure that they're not going to, to uh, be too tight as the tree grows. Another important tip is to space the trees away from buildings and fences. And you can see here the recommendations for the different sizes of trees. 20 feet from a building for a large tree, 15 feet for a medium tree, and eight feet away from a building for a small tree. And this of course also applies to fence lines because neighbors are allowed to cut or prune whatever grows over their property line. You'll also want to note the location of any power lines so that trees won't be growing up into them from uh, above. Use mulch appropriately. We were talking about mulch a, a, a little a bit ago. Of course, if you're in a forested area, the, the leaf litter and mulch area will just be completely uh, surrounding all of the plants there. But if you have a tree sited in the middle of the lawn, it's a good idea to try to have a mulch layer at least four to five feet in diameter. Ideally, you would mulch all the way to the drip line. And you can see from this uh, sample that when grass grows right up adjacent to the tree roots, the roots will not grow as deep. But if you have a layer of mulch, that will provide a lot more uh, nourishment and encouragement to those tree roots to grow. Grass and, and trees really grow in different types of soil. Grass much prefers the, the more alkaline soil. Trees prefer acidic soil. And when you are mulching, please do it appropriately. Create a kind of a donut hole, only about two to three inches deep um, and not coming up directly against the tree trunk. That uh, encourages the, the moisture to be retained there and perhaps fungus to grow. The example on the right is an excessively mulched tree with what we refer to as a volcano. For lots more information on planting and just gen general sustainable landscaping basics, uh, I've provided a link to this recording that was given by Amy Crumpton, the head of our sustainable landscaping team. This is available on our Master Gardeners website. Uh, looking at our next landscape, landscape scenario, we'll consider some shrubs that you could use for hedgerows or around the foundations of your home. Uh, two examples are wild hydrangea and inkberry. Wild hydrangea, hydrangea arborescence, is a very fast growing tree. It blooms on new wood. So what I do in my yard is to actually trim these plants way down very close to the ground and they will put on three to six feet of brand new growth with lovely dark green leaves and these flower clusters uh, in the spring. Inkberry, Ilex glabra, is uh, an evergreen native holly. It has a rounded form. The flowers uh, we would consider to be fairly insignificant, but they're very attractive for their nectar and pollen. And they, the plant will form uh, on female plants. The fruit will form in the late fall. This is another of the dioecious plants. Here are two plants with a habit somewhat like that of forsythia with that, with that arching or a fountaining habit. Uh, American beautyberry, Calicarpa americana, reaches about three to six feet. It has lavender flowers that completely surround the stem in July and this absolutely stunning fall fruit that is attractive to, I think it's about 45 species of birds. Nine bark, Physocarpus polifolius, also has that arching form. It's a little taller, reaching three to 10 feet. And like the, uh, like the uh, betula, the, the tree mentioned earlier with the peeling bark. This also has exfoliating bark. It has these lovely uh, rounded blooms in May and then forms very interesting summer fruit that will linger on providing interest. These are two plants you might consider as native replacements for invasive Nandina. 
Strawberry bush, Euotomus americanus, reaches about four to six feet in height. It it's very airy, a multi-stemmed plant. In the early spring, it has these charming flowers, yellow, delicate yellow flowers. And then this brilliant uh, bright fall fruit will form with almost day glow colors. Button bush, Cephalanthus accidentalis, uh, reaches a little taller, six to 12 feet with a very rounded form. It has these distinctive, almost satellite-like uh, fragrant flowers, very attractive to pollinators. And then a fall fruit will form. Another great example of particularly for hedgerows and foundations is Virginia sweet spire, Itea virginica. Now this so-called straight species of the tree, uh, excuse me, of the shrub reaches six to 10 feet in height and it can have either an arching or a rounded form. If you wanted a slightly shorter form, you could go for the Henry's garnet cultivar, which reaches about three to four feet or even shorter, the little Henry at two to three feet. And that is the particular form that's pictured here in the center. And you can see how it is uh, sent out suckers and actually formed a, a nice little hedge. All three uh, sizes of Virginia sweet spire will have these lovely flower clusters in May and June. And then this flaming fall color that will rival burning bush in the fall. Another lovely uh, native shrub is New Jersey tea, Ceanothus americanus. This one is a three, to feet, a three feet uh, tall and wide with a very rounded form. And this uh, particular shrub is especially effective in uh, hot and dry sections of your garden because of its massive deep roots. It has uh, flower clusters in June that are very popular with our pollinators. Two more shrubs particularly attractive for their fruit. Uh, black chokeberry, Aronia melanocarpa, has uh, spring flowers uh, set against very shiny, attractive foliage. And it will form this fall fruit. This can be eaten both by humans and by uh, our birds. It uh, is usually multi-stemmed. You, you can either uh, allow it to form just a, a single shrub or you can allow it to form a colony by spreading. Winterberry, Ilex verticillata, is another one of our native hollies. This one is, uh, is not evergreen. It's a, a deciduous holly, unlike the Ilex glabra, the inkberry. This one reaches about three to, to 12 feet. It has a rounded form. Uh, again, uh, fairly subtle flowers in June, but absolutely brilliant fruit. Now this would not be something we would eat, but it's uh, very nutritious and will actually uh, remain on the shrub through the fall, uh, the winter and into the spring and uh, provides great nutrition for our migrating birds. Uh, I'm particularly fond of the native viburnums, and there are four species that are native here, and they range in height from uh, three to six feet for the viburnum acerifolium uh, to uh, almost a tree height at 12 to 15 feet for the viburnum prunifolium. Now pictured here is arrowwood viburnum, that's viburnum dentatum. It has quilted leaves, that are distinctive. Black haw, viburnum prunifolium, is the tallest of the viburnums. And showing here is the characteristic white flowers. All, all of the viburnums have flowers that look pretty much like that. Viburnum nudum, possum haw, is uh, distinctive because it has fruits that change color over the seasons from a, a very pale minty green and then uh, it will show all of these colors simultaneously, pinks and purples and blues, very attractive. And the shortest of the viburnums is viburnum acerifolium, maple leaf viburnum. And it is notable both because of the shape of its leaves and the brilliant fall color. 
for a lots more information on how you can use these and many other native shrubs as alternatives to the overused limited palette of non-native foundation plants, I refer you to this talk that I gave uh, last year in our sustainable landscape series. And I've provided a link to that on your handout. There's uh, some special considerations that you'll want to take into account when planting to allow for optimal fruiting of your shrubs. Uh, for example, viburnum species are monoecious. That means that both the male and female flowers will be on the same plant, but they usually will give best fruiting if you have cross-pollination between different genetic vari variants. So you'll want to choose wild type plants from two or more nurseries or growers, or to choose different cultivars uh, that, of viburnum as long as they bloom at the same time. So if you're going for the straight species, you would look for viburnum dentatum. And if you wanted to get cultivars, you could choose examples such as blue muffin and little joe that bloom at the same time. Now, our dioecious, dioecious species, uh, the inkberry and winterberry hollies, have separate male and female plants. So it's necessary to have both of them in fairly close proximity for the female plant to bear fruit. You'll want to look for paired cultivars that are going to bloom at the same time. And a single male plant can service up to 10 female plants. So the example here for winterberry, you would look for Ilex verticillata red sprite as your female plant and Jim Dandy as the male. There are other examples, but these are, these are just two that bloom simultaneously. As with the trees, you'll want to consider a shrub's mature natural size. So look at those different uh, planting distances for the various uh, heights of shrubs, because in year one, a plant will look this way, but by year five, it can be considerably larger. And you want to uh, make sure to, to plant it in such a way that you'll leave space for airflow and access to the foundation of your home if you're planting it for that particular use. Uh, we'll move on to another landscape scenario, different uh, native ground covers. For sunny conditions, there are a, a wide variety to choose from. Uh, perennials, sedges, as well as even woody plants. The example of a perennial that I'm showing here is wild pink, Silene caroliniana. This has a lovely mounded form. It's evergreen and blooms uh, for about a month in April to May, just absolutely covered with these lovely pink flowers. A very attractive sedge for our region is Appalachian sedge, Carex appalachica. It reaches about 12 inches high. The, the leaf blades are just a little bit wider than those of the Pennsylvania sedge that I showed in the herb layer of the forest. Um, it, it, it's a little more robust and the, the, the dense tufts grow maybe about 18 inches wide. It can be used as shown here as an edging plant or you can use it uh, across an entire slope as a ground cover for erosion control. And a lovely example of a, a very short growing woody plant that you can use as a ground cover is fragrant, fragrant sumac, the grow low cultivar of Rus aromatica. Very vigorous and suckering and it turns this lovely brilliant color as you see in the low hedge here next to the bench. Here are some ground covers you might want to use for shady conditions. On the right is woodland stone crop, uh, sedum ternatum. It reaches only four inches high, has very interesting, uh, juicy, succulent leaves, and these beautiful star-like flowers low to the ground from April to June. In the middle, I'm showing hairy alum root, Heuchera villosa. It's a little taller, 18 to 30 inches, clumping and semi-evergreen. It blooms for quite a long period from June to October. And the particular cultivar I'm showing here is Autumn Bride, which has especially showy flowers. Then taking you into the fall would be white wood aster, Eurybia de Viricata, 
about the same height as the alum root. It has a, a loose clumping habit. And then these uh, flowers that are great nectar, late nectar source for our pollinators from July to October. There are two other favorites of mine for shady conditions. Plant and leaf sedge, Carex plantagenea, is about one foot tall and maybe about 18 inches across. It's a clumping plant. Uh, it will spread slowly by rhizomes. Uh, the nice thing is that it's evergreen. Mine made it through even the, the ice and snow this winter. It has very distinctive strap-like uh, puckered foliage and that uh, crinkling of the foliage leads to its second common name, seersucker sedge. It has these really interesting inflorescences, these flower heads. Uh, they're actually showing in my garden right now. And the stems of those flowers have alternating bands of maroon and lime green, very distinctive. Another of my favorite ferns is marginal wood fern. This does well in dry shade, Dryopteris marginalis. It reaches about 18 inches to two feet in height. It has a vase shape, very delicate feathery fronds. And the sori, those reproductive structures uh, that, uh, that produce the spores are located on the reverse sides of those fronds. Uh, in rows. Now there are some ground covers that can actually uh, do quite well in a range of sun conditions from uh, full sun to full shade. Uh, the first of these on the left is golden ragwort. This is a plant that's highly recommended by our local Audubon at home ambassadors, uh, especially as a substitute for invasive English ivy. It will begin with a basal evergreen foliage, very shiny leaves. And then very soon in April for a, a period of about three weeks, it will send up these tall 18 inch flower stalks uh, covered with very delicate daisy-like flowers that are a, an absolute poly pollinator magnet. You can allow this plant to, to self seed or you can uh, trim those flower stalks down before it seeds and it will, uh, it will spread via rhizomes from the evergreen foliage. And it provides a, a very vigorous ground cover, great replacement for that ivy. On the right is green and gold, much shorter, a mat forming plant, only six to 12 inches in height. And this blooms with these star-like flowers, compound flowers from April to May. And it can sometimes bloom uh, intermittently even into the fall. Now this particular plant, you'll want to make sure to give it uh, additional moisture if you're going to site it in a sunnier location. And then in the middle, we have golden alexanders, Zizia aurea. It reaches 18 to 36 inches and is a colony forming plant. I, I've had it spreading as a very efficient ground cover in my uh, woodland edge, and it will bloom from May to June. Now that particular plant uh, is a, a great uh, larval host plant. It, uh, like uh, parsley and fennel, will, will uh, provide uh, nourishment for uh, some of our uh, native moths. If you want to get information, more information on the plants I've discussed here and many more, uh, I refer you to this a presentation that I gave specifically on ground covers and the link is provided on your handout. Uh, one tip is that you can actually use ground cover plants as a living mulch. Once you allow them to spread, you're not going to need as, as much of a, a hardwood mulch or a leaf mulch that you would have to bring in from outside. And just to give you some ideas of how you might use your shrubs and ground covers together, you could use an upright deciduous shrub for fall fruit and foliage. And one example might be that tall viburnum prudifolium, the, the, uh, the black haw. You could use a mounted evergreen shrub, which would give you winter interest. Uh, an example would be inkberry, Ilex glabra. Then you could introduce a shorter deciduous shrub, which would give you spring interest. An example would be Ceanothus americanus, the uh, New Jersey tea. 
then you could use uh, a woody ground cover, which would also give you beautiful fall foliage. And the example is the one I pointed out earlier, the Grow Low uh, Fragrant Sumac. And then you could introduce an herbaceous flowering ground cover like the Zizia aurea. So in uh, dry to medium soil conditions, sun to part sun, you could have interest through all of the seasons. Any more questions at this point? Yes, we have just a few more. Um, is there a bird benefit to trying to get the fruits of the service berry? Uh, to get the fruits of the service berry? Y yes, that, that plant is very attractive to the birds. And if, if you can manage to get part of the harvest for yourself, then that, that's uh, something additional for you to enjoy as well. Uh, now that particular, that particular tree, the service berry, the Amelanchier arborea, um, is a monoecious uh, plant. You don't have to have two different uh, trees to, to get that fruit. The one concern that I, that I mentioned is that you're going to want to avoid planting that tree near um, any of anything in the juniper family, either that tall eastern red cedar or a low cedar ground cover or another cedar shrub, because that could be uh, a host. The, the, the fruit of, of the service berry would uh, get a, a, an orange growth on it. It wouldn't be particularly attractive. It's not going to kill the tree, but it, it just would make the fruit less appealing. Thank you, Elaine. Um, uh, Virginia Creeper, is it a viable option for our region? Yes, yes it is. Uh, we, I didn't include it here, but it is one of the ground covers that I discuss in that uh, separate presentation I mentioned. Uh, it's attractive. It can be used both as a ground cover or you can allow it to grow vertically um, on an arbor, uh, on a fence. And it is one of the plants, it can actually be allowed to grow. I don't allow it to grow up into my trees, but unlike English ivy, which will absolutely smother a tree and, and with a weight could, could pull a tree down, it, it can grow up in, into a, a tree without causing a problem. The attractive thing about that plant is not, not only those, those palmate leaves, very attractive foliage, but it turns a, a brilliant color in the fall. So that could be a, a very nice uh, native ground cover alternative. Thank you, Elaine. Um, we have quite a few questions on how to tell male and female uh, for different trees that you talked about. Um, I'm not sure if folks should send that question into the, the help desk or maybe there is an easy, easy answer to tell for fringe trees, for example, for spice bush, Yes, it, it can it can be it can be challenging. Uh, I understand for the fringe tree, for example, that the that the flowers look somewhat different from each other. But unless you saw them side by side and, and were a, a botanist, a horticulturalist, you may have difficulty discerning the difference. Uh, toward the end of the talk, I'll be talking about some sources for uh, uh, purchasing native plants. And uh, particularly if you go to native plant sellers, they're going to be much better equipped to help you make the distinctions between the, the male and the female of the plants. Ideally, uh, the plants will be labeled as to whether they're male or female. And then you can be sure with those dioecious species that you're getting at least one of each. Uh, thank you. And the last question uh, for this round is, can you suggest some native replacements for liriope? Liriope, yes. Uh, I give lots of recommendations in that separate uh, presentation on ground covers, but just to mention uh, a few right now, uh, I think the ideal replacement would be the plantain leaf sedge. That's the Carex plantaginea. It grows around the same size, the same height as liriope. It has the same wide strap-like leaves and it's evergreen. So it's a, an absolutely wonderful replacement. Um, that, that would be my ideal recommendation. Uh, now we'll begin looking at uh, native perennials for a variety of different uh, growing conditions in your garden. 
let's say you have a, a very wet area of your garden and you've been thinking about installing a rain garden. A rain garden is a designed depression that's going to absorb the runoff from rainwater that comes off of your roof. Your roof. So you'll want to use a mix of plants that are going to be adapted to the different water depths. In the central zone, that's going to be the, the moister or wetter soil, there are some tall plants that could be possibilities. The first would be New England aster. Oh, I should mention that all of these, all three that I'm going to be uh, showing you here on this slide, are going to bloom from July or August into October. So wonderful uh, bloom for a good part of the growing season. So first is New England aster. It has these lovely compound flowers, um, all flowers in that est asteraceae, the aster family, uh, have this particular structure. They have the so-called disc flowers in the center and then the rays, the, the purple petals that reach out from, from the center. The plant shown in the middle is one of many of the different Joe Pye weeds that are native to our area. This one is coastal Joe Pye, Eutrochium dubium, another tall plant. And it is distinctive because of these very large mounds uh, of, of blossoms. These provide the perfect landing spot for our pollinators. You might just be able to, to make out uh, a native uh, bumblebee there, but uh, butterflies are also particularly attractive to this as a landing pad. And then on the right, another very tall plant is New York ironweed, Vernonia noveboracensis. It has these absolutely spectacular red violet flowers, very attractive to pollinators. I don't show a picture here, but it has uh, seed heads. I, I think I'll show, I have a photo of that a little bit later on. Those are attractive to birds. Now, I forgot to mention for the aster, that is uh, an example of a perennial plant in the keystone category. Uh, Doug Tellamy has indicated that this and several others that I'll be pointing out as we go along. Plants in those particular families are especially um, outstanding in providing uh, support to our pollinators. Uh, several more plants for that central zone, uh, a little bit shorter in height. The first is a scarlet bee balm. That's going to bloom from May to July. It reaches about two to four feet in height and it's clump forming, but will spread because it's a member of the mint family. Swamp milkweed is uh, Asclepius incarnata. It reaches about four to six feet and is usually multi-stemmed. This will bloom a little bit later. It will extend the bloom into August. And I'm mentioning it specifically because in addition to providing nectar for our monarchs, it is a host plant. So the, the, the adult monarchs of both sexes will come to the plant for nectar. And then the female will return and she will lay her eggs on the underside of those leaves. When the uh, caterpillars emerge, they will be able to to feed on the foliage of this plant. That's what's meant by calling a plant a host plant. So this particular plant, unlike invasive butterfly bush, will provide nourishment for the entire life cycle of the monarch, the nectar for the adults and the foliage for the caterpillars, uh, allowing a complete generation, new generation to, to grow. The third plant shown here is cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis, beautiful erect stems of uh, bright colored flowers that bloom from the bottom up to the top. And this will carry the bloom for your uh, rain garden into July and October. Two more plants for that central zone. Uh, the first is Virginia blue flag, Iris virginica. It reaches about one to three feet in height. And like the more familiar uh, German uh, iris, it uh, will uh, grows from rhizomes and it can, can spread slowly from rhizomes. It has these lovely flag-like flowers from May to July. White turtlehead, Chelone glabra, is a very robust plant, about one to four feet. It's clumping 
and has these very distinctive flowers that are said to look like a turtle's head. And they are especially uh, uh, favored by our native bumblebees. Those particular bees are strong enough that they can pry open those flowers, reach inside for the nectar and get the pollen as well. And those will bloom from July to October. Then in the outer zone of your rain garden, you could include plants like a purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea. It's going to bloom from June to July, and then it will have these long lasting seed heads. These will form uh, in, this, in the summer, last through the fall, and I still have mine standing. These are very attractive to our uh, birds, particularly the, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name now, uh, goldfinch, goldfinches. A grass that you could include in the drier zone is a switchgrass, Panicum virgatum. It reaches about three to six feet in height. It's what's referred to as a warm season grass, a clumping warm season grass. This was uh, one of the primary grasses native to, uh, to the Midwest, but it also grows here as well. It has these lovely, very airy, distinctive flower heads, uh, kind of pinkish purple in color. The flowers will form in July and then last through, they'll take on a tawny color, they'll last through into February. And the central picture shows how the two plants are used together in a rain garden. Uh, the, the switchgrass has very deep roots. They, they go even uh, 10 to 12 feet deep. So they're excellent for sto soil stabilization. Uh, several more plants for the outer zone of a rain garden, uh, threadleaf coreopsis, coreopsis verticillata. This plant grows in bushy clumps, uh, sometimes a short as six inches up to three feet. It has very feathery foliage and these lovely flowers from June to August. Blazing star is one of four different liatris that I'm aware of that grow uh, locally. This is liatris spicata. It uh, reaches about one to four feet in height, a very tall, erect and a clump forming plant with these flowers from July to August. Now we'll look at some plants for a completely different uh, landscape, uh, dry streetscapes, those uh, sections of the yard that we sometimes refer to as hell strips, those hot, dry curbside beds. We'll start out with two uh, shrubs for that area. The first is common yucca, yucca filamentosa. You might not even realize that this is a shrub. It's a stemless shrub. It has a rosette of very tall uh, sword-like leaves that reach about three feet in height. And then it will send up this tall flowering stalk to six feet that uh, blooms from July, uh, June to July. Uh, a mat growing a shrub is creeping juniper that it isn't particularly tall, I, uh, six to 18 inches tall, but it can spread over a wide area and it is evergreen. Now the plant shown on the right is a perennial wild indigo, Baptisia tinctoria, but it has a, a shrub-like habit. It's quite sizable with a deep root system. It reaches about two to three feet in height and spread, and that will bloom from May to June. Some shorter plants, a more uh, ground cover in height uh, for that dry streetscape. Pussy toes, Antenaria plantaginifolia. It reaches six to 12 inches in height. It has woolly basal leaves and then sends up these stalks with these charming flowers that look almost like kitten's paws, very soft. Uh, a, a completely different texture of plant is uh, Eastern prickly pear, Opuntia humifusa. Surprisingly, this is native to our area, six to 12 inches in height, and it has fleshy pads, and then this reddish fruit referred to as tunas. It has lovely blossoms. Each one blooms for only a day but they will bloom in succession from June through July. Now, this is one plant you'll want to handle very carefully because of, of those thorns and the, the barbed uh, hairs that are referred to as glockids. 
here's some tips for planting perennials. Uh, ideally, you're going to choose plants from many different plant families. They're going to have a variety of flower shapes because those will be suitable for different pollinators. And they will also have a range of bloom times. Now, just as an example, I've chosen some yellow flowers. Up at the top, golden alexanders will bloom in April. The tall Carolina lupin will bloom in May. Cup plant will bloom in August. And you could continue the bloom with Canada goldenrod into September. Ideally, you'll plant uh, your perennials in odd numbers, uh, three, five, seven. That will make them much more visually appealing. And another tip is to plant them in masses, about three, to, uh, three by th three feet. Um, this will make them especially beneficial for pollinators. Uh, a large mass will attract them visually, and it will also allow for much more efficient uh, nectaring. They won't the pollinators won't have to be hopping from plant to plant. They can find them all within a very close range. When you purchase your perennials, they may come in any size from gallons and quarts all the way down to very small plugs. But the tip for all of them is you'll want to gently loosen the roots for planting. You don't want them to be root bound. You can use a pruning technique uh, to reduce the height of your plants. Uh, that's going to limit the need for staking. And you can also somewhat control the height if you want it to grow in a particular location. So this, this plant here is Fireworks Goldenrod. And the, uh, the straight species will grow uh, four feet in height, but I use a pinching back technique that uh, allows it to remain at about 18 inches. And you can see here, I'm using it as a ground cover surround for this native shrub, the oak leaf hydrangea. And a book that I highly recommend, and I, I don't believe I listed it, this in your handouts, but uh, perhaps uh, Leslie can add this and I'll give you the full citation. It's The Well-Tended Perennial Garden by Tracy de Sabato Aust. And she gives many wonderful tips for exactly when and how to trim back or pinch back your uh, perennials. A few more tips. Uh, this uh, showing on the left, these are the seed heads of the uh, New York ironweed that I mentioned earlier. And you'll want to keep seed heads for this plant and your other perennials standing through the winter. They're going to give you great winter interest in your garden and will provide nourishment for birds and other wildlife. And for plants that have large stems, stems that are at least pencil size or wider, the one shown here is, um, is the uh, Joe Pye weed, you're going to want to keep those because those stems can be used as habitat for native bees. Now we'll look at some, per some perennials that you could use in a wildlife garden. Certain uh, landscape designers have come up with certain formulas for uh, planting a garden with perennials. And uh, Thomas Rainier, a local landscaper, and his uh, associate, Claudia West, have um, written this book, Planting in a Post-Wild World, that goes into detail describing how to go about doing this. Basically, you use three different categories of plants. You'll have what are referred to as structural plants. Uh, you, you'll use about 10 to 15% of those plants that are tall and create a framework or focal points, some architectural structure to your beds. Next, you'll choose a larger percentage of what they call seasonal theme plants. They're going to be plants that are going to give you a variety of textures, those different flower types that I referred to, and changing color through uh, the whole growing season. Finally, you'll have the ground layer plants, 50 to 60% of those. Those are going to be plants that will reseed or grow via rhizomes easily, and they will spread to create a, a permanent ground layer for you. So to give you an example, and this is included in your handout, I went to the Plant Nova Natives website and saw this design 
by a local landscaper, Elisa Mira. And what I've done is to add to her design with little thumbnail pictures of the plants that she's describing. And I'm very quickly going to show you just some examples of, of those plants here. For structural plants, those would be, uh, in her example, just two plants or 14% of the total design. Uh, the first is red chokeberry. This is another one of the chokeberries. I mentioned the black chokeberry earlier. This one uh, has a slightly taller uh, habit to it. It reaches six to eight feet in height. It flowers in April. Uh, and this fruit, rather than being a dark purplish blue, is red. This one is a little less popular. Uh, I wouldn't eat it uh, myself, whereas you can eat the black chokeberry fruit. Uh, and this will last, as you can see uh, from my garden picture here, into the winter months. Uh, uh, earlier on, I mentioned that Virginia Sweet Spire, and she's showing that as her foundation, uh, her structural plant here. Uh, a great example of seasonal themed plants would be these two, uh, common milkweed and butterfly weed. These are both in the Asclepius genus. And these are, I'm mentioning these specifically because along with the Asclepius incarnata, the uh, swamp milkweed that I mentioned as a great central plant for your rain garden, these are three ideal species to, to provide both the nectar that monarch butterflies need and that uh, important nourishment for their caterpillars. Here's some more seasonal themed plants. You, you may recognize the Rudbeckias, the, the black and, and brown eyed Susans. Uh, the black eyed Susan is the native plant for Maryland. Uh, late purple aster is another keystone plant and all of these plants are going to bloom from summer to fall. Here's some examples of ground layer plants that are recommended for that particular planting and you'll want 50% of these. Uh, on the left is barren strawberry, GM for Garagodes, that reaches four to nine inches in height, really attractive trifoliate leaves, blooms from April to May. Now, this is not to be confused with another native uh, strawberry, the Fragaria virginiana, which also spreads as a ground cover, but that one has white flowers. And these both are distinctive from the weedy, non-native uh, Indian strawberry, Potentilla indica. The central plant shown here is blue-eyed grass. And despite its name, it is actually not a grass. It's a member of the iris family with very delicate flowers, blue flowers in May to June. And gray goldenrod, Saladego nemoralis, uh, will carry you into the fall with flowers blooming in August to September. And this is another one of the keystone plants. Two more ground layer plants are narrow leaf sun drops and this mountain mint. The sun drops uh, have short leaf, short lived flowers, but they will bloom uh, in a cluster in, in quick succession. And it has evergreen basal foliage. It turns a, a really attractive coppery red in the fall. Narrow leaf mountain mint is uh, one of a number of native mints. And these uh, are pollinator magnets. In some pollinator trials that were conducted uh, by Pennsylvania State Extension, the, the mountain mints were shown to attract more types of pollinators and greater numbers of pollinators than just about any other number of plant. And these two plants shown here will carry you uh, from July into September. And finally, two more ground layer plants. These are grasses. Purple lovegrass, Aragrostis spectabilis, begins with uh, very airy uh, mint green uh, seed heads. And then these will turn this beautiful pink. Uh, this is a bunching warm season grass. So it will give you a whole range of seasonal color. Little blue stem, Schizocurium scoparium, is somewhat taller, another one of the clumping warm season grasses. And it has a range of seasonal color. First, you'll see it with this uh, beautiful uh, bluish green that gives it its name, little blue stem. But then it takes on this lovely tawny color and has airy, uh, silvery, fluffy seed heads in the, the fall and the winter. 
a few tips uh, for uh, purchasing your perennials. Uh, first, when you're looking for the straight species, those are going to be the species that are the typical form that's found in nature. They haven't been crossbred or hybridized. And these are also known as wild type plants. So looking at the uh, plant label, uh, it's usually written in italics. You'll see two names, a two part name. The first is the genus and the second is the species. So for this example, the common name is goat's beard and the scientific name is Aronchus dioicus. Now, you may also see cultivars when you go to nurseries. And these are plants that have been selected by breeding for very specific traits. It could be for a bloom color, a longer bloom time, a drought or disease resistance, and a very popular uh, trait would be compactness, especially for shrubs. Now, these plants are not reproduced uh, sexually. These are cloned via cuttings so that these traits are reproduced consistently. A an example here is uh, the nine bark, Physocarpus apulifolius, and Amber Jubilee is the cultivar name. So the genus and species are shown in italics and the, the cultivar name is shown in single quotes. It's really important, if at all possible, to opt for the straight species of a plant over the cultivars. Uh, first of all, the cultivars may have a change of leaf color from the uh, straight green to red or even purple, and that's going to modify the chemistry of the plant. So here's an example. Arrowwood, that's one of the viburnums, has these quilted green leaves. And one of its cultivars, the red feather cultivar, the foliage has turned to this red color. That means that the, the uh, chlorophyll, the green uh, chem chemistry that's naturally in the leaves has been changed to anthocyanins and it can no longer serve as a larval host plant. That it's not going to, to be able to feed the, uh, the caterpillars of our native butterflies and moths. Another issue with cultivars is that the large showy blossoms that have been selected may have fewer fertile flowers or reduced nectaries. So here are two examples. With wild hydrangea, a native shrub, this is what the straight species flowers look like. Here is the very popular Annabelle cultivar. The flowers look much more like uh, the, the uh, Mac, the macrophylla version of hydrangea, the, the pinks and the, and the blues that we're more familiar with, the non-natives. Unfortunately, as attractive as those are, those flowers are, are sterile, so they're not going to provide any benefit for, for pollinators. You can actually see the, uh, the, the stamens uh, on the, the native flowers above. Now for purple cone flower, the straight species has this very distinctive large cone surrounded by the rays. In this double delight cultivar, the cone has been almost completely reduced, making way for many more petals. It's beautiful, it's very attractive from, from our standpoint, but it uh, has completely reduced the nectaries down, so there won't be any source of nectar or pollen for the insects. And as a reminder, the cultivars are propagated clonally, so they're not going to have the genetic variation that's going to make them more adaptable, especially for concerns like uh, climate change. I'd like to uh, give you a little more information ab about Master Gardeners. We are trained uh, by Virginia Cooperative Extension uh, to share uh, <clears throat> scientific-based knowledge from our two land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. And we share that information in a variety of ways. In, uh, in, in addition to the classes like today's class, we have a help desk. And I believe Leslie has provided this uh, address, this email address in the chat box, but I'll repeat it here. It's MG for Master Gardener, A-R-L for Arlington, a-L-E-X 
for Alexandria at gmail.com. And you can send any of your gardening questions to our help desk and they will, they will get back to you with thoroughly researched responses. When we can resume them, uh, uh, we will uh, bring back our plant clinics. These are held at multiple locations in farmers markets and at our Arlington Central Library. And also throughout Arlington and in one location in Alexandria, we have a number of demonstration gardens that show uh, many of the species that I've been discussing here in addition to others. Uh, they can show you best management techniques and provide a lot of inspiration for you and your own gardening. Now, Virginia Cooperative Extension uh, locally is supported by Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, a nonprofit organization. We have a website that I've referred to a number of times. It's www.mgnv.org. We also have a Facebook uh, and Instagram as well as a, a Twitter. Uh, we have Twitter posts. Now, these are the fact sheets that I have made mention to several times. You can find them directly by using the links on your handout. But if you were to go to our website, you would look under the plants menu tab, go down to native plants for the mid-Atlantic and then further to whatever category of plant you wanted to see. This example I'm showing here is for perennials. That would take you from this list. You could choose a, a fact sheet on plants. This one is for Eastern Columbine. And we also uh, associated with those plant sheets have many videos actually showing uh, pollinators in action. On the website, you'll also find many gardening articles. Uh, I will be giving two uh, upcoming presentations in April and May. One of them will be on native plants that are specifically for wet conditions and the other on plants for dry conditions. You can see the dates here and I believe I've listed those on your handout as well. Uh, these are some examples of the Facebook and Instagram posts that I do. I have some regular series that run on Facebook on Tuesdays, every day on, uh, our, <clears throat> on our Instagram site and also uh, on Twitter. If you'd like to be actually able to see uh, the native plants I've been discussing, you can go, as I mentioned, to our demonstration gardens, the, the picture you're seeing on the upper left is uh, from our sunny garden and these other locations, the US National Arboretum, Meadowlark Botanical Gardens, the US uh, Botanic Garden in Washington, and the garden pictured in the center is at the Nature Conservancy. And for those of you from uh, farther lying areas, of course, uh, Longwood Gardens and uh, Winterthur up in Pennsylvania, uh, the Norfolk Botanical Garden is absolutely lovely in uh, Southern Virginia. I've ha had great enjoyment seeing gardens down in uh, North Carolina and Georgia. So you could check with your local uh, native plant society to find out about more of those. As far as where to buy plants, I refer you to the Plant Nova Natives website. They have a list of native only sellers. Some of them are right here in Northern Virginia, some a little further afield. And, and again, for those of you watching from uh, further out, you can refer to your native plant societies or maybe talk to your uh, local uh, cooperative extension offices to get more information. Just to give you a little last bit of inspiration, this, these are some pictures from my garden uh, almost all native plants, including trees and shrubs showing through the season. This is spring, moving a little bit later into the season. A forested area back in May to July, and then a variety of plants, uh, August to October. Do we have any final questions, Aista? We have a few more. Um, thank you. This this has been such a wonderful uh, presentation, and you answered a lot of the questions in the chat. Any quick tips for planting perennial native garden on a hillside? On a hillside, um, what you're going to want to do is probably find the plants 
that are going to do well in drier conditions. So for example, if you uh, attend the talk that I'm gonna be giving on that, I'll, I'll give you some examples. Uh, there are a variety of plants that can, that can do well. The, the grasses, because they are have such deep roots, will be able to reach moisture further down and they will, they will set up a, a, a really deep root structure that will, uh, will help maintain the soil. Uh, some of the, the sedges that I mentioned, particularly the, the uh, Appalachian sedge, that one I've seen planted on an entire hillside um, at Longwood Gardens. And with those very uh, robust tufts of plants, they, they can prevent erosion. Another great example on, on, a, on the hillside was the uh, golden ragwort. So that's going to have attractive evergreen leaves and then the beauty of the, of the flowers uh, in the spring. Uh, another a great shrub for, uh, for a dry area and for a slope would be the nine bark that I mentioned. That one has a, a, an exceedingly deep root structure. Thank you, Lane. How about maybe a few suggestions for um, base of the hill that's really wet or suggestions for native plants to help st stabilize the stream bank? Stream banks. Okay, uh, again, the, the, the native grasses can be a wonderful solution for that. Um, you, would, you would look for the plants that would actually do better in the wet conditions. Um, they, that switchgrass, can, can, can because it, I mentioned it as doing well in a rain garden, can tolerate a, a range of conditions. And that could be one that could help stabilize. Um, I mentioned several others in, in my talk on native grasses. Some that do well in, in shadier conditions would be bottle brush grass, Elimus hystrix, and uh, Chasmanthium latifolium that is uh, sea oats. Sea oats uh, is a particularly uh, robust, uh, somewhat aggressive plant. And along a stream bank, you would actually want a plant to, to, to be very aggressive uh, to help stabilize that bank. So those would be uh, two examples. Um, there, any of the shrubs that I've mentioned here that, that like those moist conditions would, would be very nice to add uh, along a stream bank. One of the plants that I discuss, um, a perennial that I discuss in the, in the uh, ground covers talk is uh, Calpha palustris. That one is marsh marigold and that one can actually uh, grow in, in standing water. Um, another plant for standing water would be uh, would be any of the would be the rushes the na the native rushes juncus j u n c u s. Elaine, uh, would you recommend that folks remove all invasives first and then plant uh, natives, or would a piecemeal approach uh, to avoid er erosion be better? Oh, for eroding uh, avoiding erosion, uh, it it depends completely on the size of your slope. If, if you have a relatively small area, I would actually suggest removing the, uh, the invasives, whether it's the, the vinca, the liriope, the, uh, the English ivy, I would suggest removing them first. Uh, <clears throat> there are certain techniques and I describe those in my presentation on uh, invasive plants certain techniques that you can use for really making sure you've, you've uh, removed all of the roots. And then you would uh, introduce these native species. You could, uh, could use either plugs or somewhat larger sizes. If you have a limited budget, you might want to go with the plugs. And then you would space them maybe about a foot apart and eventually those will be spreading. You would have a nice layer of mulch to kind of fill in in the interim, but they would eventually spread. If on the other hand, you have a very large area, I would suggest just concentrating on one area at a time. Maybe start at the top of the slope and um, 
remove that area as thoroughly as you can, remove the invasives, introduce your replacement plants there, and then over time, work your way down. Now, many of us who uh, absolutely ad adore native plants now began with exactly this same situation. We maybe uh, bought our uh, property and native plants were already there. That was, was my case. But I have to admit, unknowingly, many years ago, I actually went out and, and introduced some of these plants. And when I, I learned more about it, then, then I went about removing them and replacing them. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, perhaps the last question, how, um, any suggestions on how to control the common milkweed? The, the common milkweed, I myself have decided not to grow that particular milkweed. I've, I've uh, decided that since the, the other two, the swamp milkweed and the butterfly weed uh, are a little easier to manage that I will just uh, restrict myself to those because because they're a little easier to control. Uh, you, uh, the, the problem would be that they can, they can spread in a number of different ways. They can spread underground, but then you'll see them popping up in different areas of your garden, widely spaced away from your original planting. And that's simply because those, those windborne seeds, those very uh, feathery, airy seeds have spread. Now you could, um, perhaps just limit yourself to, to growing the plants and then cut off those seed pods, not, uh, not allow them to spread. That might be one way to do it. But I think you may still find, if, if you're concerned about something that's going to get a little too rambunctious, that that, that may, may not be the, the ideal plant. And you might want to use one of the, the other plants if you're looking to support pollinators. Thank you, Elaine. I think that's all the questions, um, outstanding questions we had. Elaine, I'm going to throw one more at you, um, just because I saw that a couple people echoed they wanted this one addressed. Um, the, Jonathan asked, if I purchase the straight species that I've confirmed is a native here, is it acceptable to purchase plants from an online nursery? Uh, well, if you go to that uh, Plant Nova Natives website, they actually list uh, at least one um, native plant online nursery. Now, my understanding is that I, ideally, you're going to be purchasing plants from, uh, from a nursery that, that's local. That you're going to have what's referred to as the local ecotypes. They're going to do absolutely the best in your region because they have grown up in this region and then they've, they've um, reproduced sexually, they've multiplied in, in this region. But um, if, if, a, if an online source is, is your only source of plants, then, then I would suggest going, going with that. And if, if at all possible, uh, <clears throat> let's say you're in the mid-Atlantic region, try to find an online source within the mid-Atlantic. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I can't wait for you to see the chat because there's so much love there. Um, my sincere thanks and appreciation to Lane for this wonderful presentation, and especially to ISTA for fielding our questions today. It's always a very big job when we have so many um, participants on the line.